Hi, I'm Lucy Davenport and I'm here being interviewed about the play Unraveled. If you'd like to find out some more about the play itself, please join us for this conversation. I think that I was very lucky in that I fell in love with theatre because my parents, although they were both doctors, took me to the theatre a lot when I was a child. And the one that really sticks out in my mind is um, going down, I lived in the north of England and I went down to London to see um, the uh, Royal Shakespeare Company do Nicholas Nickleby, which was this epic, legendary production. It was over six hours, you went in the afternoon, you went for a dinner break and then you went back. Um, I must have been about eight or nine, I think, and I just wanted it never, never to stop, uh, this world that they created on there. And I think that ever since then, I just had a love of it. Oh, I also have to give a caveat that my parents, though they're both doctors, they met at the theatre club um, at medical school. So it's their fault. It's totally their fault. <laughs> And I think that it was very interesting. I was at a school that was that did I did lots of theatre at school, but uh, no one had mentioned to me that drama school was a thing. It just wasn't on the agenda. So I went to college, I did my three year degree, uh, and then I was like, well, how do I become an actor? Um, and some people do go straight from college, but I did a I didn't do a drama degree. Um, so then I went to drama school, and that was when I really made the decision to make it a profession as opposed to just dabbling around the edges. I would say I fell in love with acting very early. I used to make my brother and sister do plays with me, which involved dressing my poor brother up as a girl. Uh, he was always the maid or the one who was being bossed around. And we had a little alcove in our house, which my parents put a curtain across. So we used to do um, little plays on Sunday afternoons and make all the parents sit through them. And I think from then on, I've always loved it. Um, I think I knew that I wanted to do it when I, was probably older, 17 or 18. Um, but th it, then again, it, it just takes a while to understand how you get, when your parents aren't in the business, to understand how you get into it. So I think I made that leap, uh, probably when I was about 16, I decided that I would do all arts A-levels, which is the, you know, the the last exams you do in England. And, um, and more profoundly when I was at college where I did my degree but I also did 28 plays some of them very badly um, and that was so it's kind of an informal training I did everything I did Shakespeare I did Neil Simon I did just everything at the Edinburgh Festival so I think at that point I was like yes this is this is how I'm going to lead my life I think acting on stage as opposed to on film is unique because you have that immediate feedback um, and I think that's what you miss most uh, during the last 18 months when that hasn't been possible. I was actually rehearsing for a play when the pandemic hit and it got shut down, but you get an immediate feeling of feedback from the audience. And it's more than feedback, it's it's like you're having an experience together. Um, and it's being in that room and feeling the electricity in the, in the air and feeling the gasps or the in-breaths of the audience, or the, you know, sometimes the laugh or a, you know, even, you know, a, a sort of an exclamation and at the end feeling how profoundly you've changed that space and their minds hopefully or just even entertained them and had some experience together and you know film you it's a very delayed uh, reaction you get you know you don't know immediately um, and I did a lot of theatre in my early years. God, that makes me sound about 85. In my early years. Um, so I got used to that very immediate feedback, that feeling of companionship that you have when you watch something in the theatre that you can, uh, you can look at the whites of their eyes and you can feel when something works. And um, in film, it's just a very different way of approaching the work because you're you're not looking for that feedback. You're not looking for that companionship. You're you're looking to sort of preserve something in the moment for later. So I think that's why for me, theatre will always be part of my of my sort of. I've I've no um, you know I've no reason to ever want to stop doing theatre because of that. And that's what I miss doing this year, to be honest. Well, I think that. Um, if you're developing a character for any medium, you've got to go through a process. And I was very lucky that my drama school gave you like a whole box of tools that you can use um, and you pick the ones that, you know, worked for you. Um, 
I would say that uh, a theatre, when you're preparing to play a character for theatre, you just have the luxury of rehearsal, which is that you can try things out, you can really... Um, you can take your time and build layers. They, they actually once at drama school told us to do a, like a pie chart. Um, and the pie chart could be like, okay, this is like 30% Cruella de Vil plus, you know, 20% Lady Macbeth with a bit of, you know, so you'd actually um, really develop this kind of amalgamation of things that you were your, and she walks like this and she wears these shoes and you actually get to practice that. and you know, see if it works. Um, and so it's a very gradual process of building up layers. In film, you have to do that kind of privately as you prepare your own script. And you get a lot more props on the outside, you know, they'll literally transform you into looking like the person that you're supposed to be. And you'll step into a, a set where that will be exactly the room that you're supposed to be in. But it's almost immediate, you have to find that where you are, um, and find that character in in a much more private and you don't get to try it out so many times. Sometimes you do, I've done films where you, we do have rehearsal, but um, that's the big difference for me. I, I enjoy both for different reasons, but um, I, I definitely enjoy the process of slowly building layers that you get in rehearsal. So, I mean, I think what's interesting about doing a long run of a play is that you have this tension. Um, and I have done, you know, a show where I've been playing the same character for a year. And the tension becomes that you become so um, used to it and so it's like second nature to you. You've got to still keep your eye on where you were at the beginning. Otherwise, the performance becomes too unfocused. Um, but also just the joy of discovering things as you go along, you know, finding places that work, building, um, without kind of jeopardizing the, the arc that you've built for your character or other people's performance. Um, and also you just get to be a lot naughtier. Uh, you know, if you're doing a long run run of a play, you can really commit to the performance, but you can also be trying to make your colleagues laugh and doing bad things upstage, which, um, just, I think when you're doing a long run, you're doing eight shows a week, which is a lot, um, you know, keeps it fresh, keeps it enjoyable uh, in a way that doesn't impact the audience's enjoyment, but makes it fun for you to keep it alive. I first read a play by Jake Broder, probably in around 2001 when I met him. And full disclosure, I married him in 2004 and I'm still married to him. So <laughs> I've read everything that he's written since then. Um, we have a very collaborative um, sort of relationship, which is one of the great things about working together is that we really enjoy it. We really thrive on that. Um, we liked, I, I usually am the first person to read something when he's finished it. And then it becomes a process of going back and forth. So when I come to it as an actor, um, I've already done a lot of work on the script, uh, which is really lovely. And I don't have to dive into a script that's completely new to me. Um, the process is also, you know, I have to make a shift from being an editor really to being uh, an actor. And at that point, I have to stop thinking about whether this works in this arc or changing the words. I have to commit to what's on the page. Um, Jake's writing is always complex. It's always, he does not like to preach to the audience or, you know, over explain anything. He likes to leave the audience to catch up and make their own decisions, which I love. I love that space in the work to do that. Um, and he's also not afraid of like big topics. I think that, you know, his work looks at all kinds of things from, you know, school shootings to uh, Alzheimer's and all those related diseases. And I just enjoy the the range of that. Jake also trained in, we were actually at rival drama schools in London. Uh, he trained in England. So we have a lot of the same vocabulary um, and that's really hugely useful. So we both come from a basis of that English theatre training and then we have transformed that hopefully successfully into all other mediums, but still we have this basis in theatre, which I think is really, uh, we have a, you know, a lot of the same tools, a lot of the same feelings about what works. And we saw a lot of the same theatre at the same time, so. I first heard about the story of Unraveled when Jake came in from the car, where he was like half an hour later than he should have been. And I said, where, do you, where have you been? And he said, I was listening, sitting in the car, listening to the radio. And they'd had this small segment on Radio Lab about 
the um, relationship between Anne Adams, uh, who is the protagonist in Unraveled, and Ravel, uh, who wrote Bolero. And he came in and he was completely fired up and, and, he, and he immediately that evening went away and researched it. So from that point, point onwards, I was really interested in the story because it's fascinating. This scientist who suddenly started painting um, and then, you know, seemed to have this whole like different life open up ahead of her. Uh, which then became uh, intertwined with the disease that she was suffering from. Um, and I, don't, I can't remember exactly when I was like, I think I need to play Anne. Um, I think maybe when I read the first draft and I thought this is, it's one of those parts, it's written for a, a mature woman. That makes me sound about 85 again. Uh, someone who's very smart, someone who's, an, well, hopefully I could do that. But um, it was... And, and Jake did tell me afterwards, not when I first read it, but afterwards that he had me in mind when he wrote it. So that was really useful. It just, I read it and I was like, I completely get this person. I know where they're coming from. I know what their background is. Sometimes you get that as an actor where you just like, like there's, there's not a lot of work involved. You don't have to do a massive amount of, of like imagining yourself as that person because you just are. And when I read the first draft, I think I was like, oh, I have to play Anne. And I think I did say to Jackie, I was like, you're not doing this without me. Um, and he was like, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> I can't always say that. I have to be careful because I can't be just like every part that I fancy in his work, be like, oh, I, I, I hose you that, that's mine. Um, because it has to be serving the work. Uh, but this one I knew, I knew that I could hopefully do justice to it. So I just told him very clearly that he wasn't doing it without me. <laughs> So in Unraveled, um, the story really is about Anne Adams, who is a preeminent scientist. Uh, she's been led her own cell line. She's been a very she's been a, a real sort of light in the world of biology for years and years. And then her son had a very traumatic um, car accident and was that I don't think they thought he was going to live. And after going through rehab, he had to come home and recover. So Anne decided to leave her job and look after him and help him recover, which he did, which is amazing. Now, while she was at home helping him recover, she started to paint. And and I'm going to slip into I now because I'm so close to this character. I think that um, I started to paint and it was very... Uh, prosaic things I painted strawberries um, and it wasn't honestly very good but sometime in this period after her son was recovered and in fact went back to college um, she started painting in a completely different style uh, and became obsessed with the piece of music Bolero by Ravel and would play it literally play it over and over and over again and she started to paint it she started to translate that piece of music into a visual piece. And this was absolutely, completely different from anything she'd done before. Um, and at the end, they you know you reveal this piece and it really is astonishing. Um, it's completely different in style from anything she'd ever done. And she, it was so good that she even got it shown in a gallery. Um, and her husband, who she was very close to uh, at this stage is you know, excited by this painting, bemused by it, not really understanding where this complete change of focus came from. Um, and as she goes on and starts to paint other things, other things that happen to her or abstract things she translates into paintings, um, she starts to get other symptoms. She starts to lose words. She seems to um, not be able to communicate what she's thinking. So eventually, after lots of resistance from Anne, her husband takes her to a neurologist and they find out that she's actually suffering from a form of dementia um, called uh, prefrontal aphasia. And um, this is a very cruel disease where slowly, slowly your ability to speak um, goes and then slowly, slowly also you lose the ability to function physically, to point, to hold things, and then eventually to breathe. Um, so, but what is the extraordinary thing about this was that this disease, which was really a death sentence and a horrible, horrible discovery for both her and her husband, had also unlocked this amazing creativity in her. And I think the play explores what happens when someone you love is sick or what happens when you are sick uh, with something that you know is going to kill you, but it's also freed you to do something beautiful. 
Um, and I think that a lot of people can really connect with this because we are, almost all of us are going to have the experience of having someone we love get Alzheimer's or a form of dementia because our bodies are outliving our brains. We're living so much longer um, that we have this whole uncharted territory between, you know, 80 and 110 now where we're all going to get really, really old because medicine can keep us alive longer. But how will our brains cope with that? And the experience of caring for someone with a degenerative disease or being someone with a degenerative disease is really what this play is about. Um, and it's been extraordinary, I would say, a huge number, 75% of the hundreds of people who've seen this have something like that in their lives, have taken care of someone who's sick, have experienced some kind of memory loss, have known someone they love go into a dark place where they think they can't follow. Um, and that to me is why this is not only an extraordinary story um, of somebody rising above a terrible diagnosis, but also it touches on experience that almost all of us have experience of, which is what happens when somebody you love changes or disappears. Well, we staged this production during the pandemic, so we had some very unique um, challenges. We could not be in the same room. In fact, we did this whole production without... I knew all these actors, and that was a huge, huge advantage. We were incredibly lucky that Jake and Nikki, the director, knew just like world-class people to do these jobs who, of course, were available because it's a pandemic and nobody is working. None of the theatre actors anyway. And so we, they were able to A, pick their A number one team because everyone was available. Um, and then it was all actors I'd worked with before on other shows. So the fact that we were rehearsing over Zoom and then shooting on a platform called OBS, which is a little like Zoom, um, it could have been almost impossible to connect with people. But I knew these people. I knew how good they were. I knew that their performances would reach beyond the little box that we were in. And actually, we did have the luxury of rehearsal. Even during rehearsal, I felt that little box wasn't containing us. You know, I was reaching out beyond the screen to really connect with those other people. And that's what... So it was an extraordinary... That one of the hardest things were we rehearsed in Zoom looking at each other. But once we got to shoot, we had to look into the camera or to some very specific eye lines in order to create the illusion of the space that we were in. So uh, if you turn the camera around and see my space, I had sticky notes which had, you know, where the paintings were, where the other actors were going to be standing for it to look right on Zoom, which was very counterintuitive. But we'd had that three weeks of really rehearsing together. I already knew these people. I felt very comfortable with them. So it was possible. And of course, you roll the dice. It was kind of a new ven venture. But I'm really hoping that from the feedback we've got, people really felt that connection. They felt that relationship. They almost forgot that we weren't in the same room together. And that's what we were aiming for. Something that was so simple that sort of after about 10 minutes or so, you forget that we're not sitting at the same table or, you know. And that I think was a tribute to the other actors who were just fantastic to work with. And Nikki, uh, who was so deft in you know, guiding us through that, what worked, what didn't work, um, and really pushing us quite hard to overcome the, the limitations of that medium. So one of the challenges of this production is that we had to do, as an actor, you had to do everything. So you had to be your own lighting guy, you had to be your own prop master, you had to be your own uh, wardrobe mistress, which is very good for us because it's, you know, usually we have the amazing luxury of leaving this, those jobs to somebody else. But I don't know. I would think we just had to do it. So if you would have um, seen my setup, I had my screen and I had um, all my post-it notes and then I had all my props and my costumes all hung next to me. Um, and I knew exactly where the edge of frame was. So this is where this medium, which was live, th live recorded theatre, actually it was very useful to have had the film experience I've had because I knew how to work that frame and where the frame ended which is something you don't have to wor worry about in theatre, but I knew how to, to hopefully work with that. 
So uh, the technical people were amazing. I could not have done what they did. They queued us in and queued us out. So we had almost like a stage manager actually bringing us on, which is, you know, bringing your square up and then taking you off when you exited, but also just doing all the timing of putting in, we had projections, we had, you know, uh, of Anne's paintings and pictures of her brain scans. And so all of these things happening at once, somebody else was queuing those, thank goodness, because I couldn't have done that. Um, but it was also amazing in that we were able to, uh, the first weekend that we shot, we were able to run the play two or three times with all the technical stuff. Um, and Jake and Nikki were able to give us notes and we were able to go back and redo parts that we wanted to. So we had some of the luxury of film where you get to go redo something uh, without the, the pressure of doing a full, well, we did do full live performances and that's what you see, but just occasionally if... There was a technical hitch. I mean, one of the things we were battling, of course, is that we had to have um, everybody plugged into a router so that we had streaming um, without interruption. And, you know, Leo, who played Dr. Miller, had one day where his internet kept going out and we kept losing these beautiful takes that he'd done. Uh, or we do the whole play and they come back and say, oh, sorry, we lost Leo at the end. <laughs> and uh, so we'd have to go back and do those bits again. But that was in some ways the advantage of the medium. Um, so we got some of the real advantages of running a play all at once because things happen when you do that instead of chopping it up like in a film. But then we were able to go back and push in and just do little bits that hadn't worked because of technical stuff. Uh, but honestly, it was physically exhausting. I was like, I was on my feet for an hour and a half with, you know, props, costumes, lighting, blah, 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 blah. And I had a big, like, on my wall I had in my big sort of scene list obviously I'd memorized the whole play but just remembering which prop to pick up when and where which scene was you know all of those things um, so and then one very unexpected problem was we were all mics with radio mics on which were fed straight into the sound but um, things wouldn't happen I'm actually in my office garage now uh, and uh, there are trees outside and in the middle of one of our run throughs there was this incredible squawking noise so much that the sound guy came on and said to me lucy what is that noise so they could hear it through my body mic and uh it was that f flock of parrots from pasadena and literally there were 40 parrots sitting in the tree outside the garage all going, nyah, 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 nyah. and we we were like we can't continue with these parrots they were so noisy so we had to go outside and then we were like we tried we were clapping we were like uh rattling things and then finally they went away but it's that kind of thing where you you, you occasionally have the siren or a, a a mobile phone in a theater that that interrupts you but when you're standing in your garage uh it's all you know parrots will come and parrots will squawk so I will always remember that that moment. I really would love the audience for Unraveled to um, remember that all forms of dementia are not necessarily just a terrible, terrible death sentence. That we could refocus how we see people with disease as, uh, you know, I think there's a, a tendency now to be like, oh, you know, you're broken and it's just like a, a, a hill. You're going to go down the hill. You're going to get worse and worse and worse until you die. And there's nothing you can do about it and you're powerless. Um, what I would love them to understand is that there can be tremendous beauty and even weirdly enough positivity in, um, in that disease. And if it takes you... If you have 10 years left with dementia, you could achieve beautiful things. You could achieve amazing things. We've seen this over and over again in the people watching it and the people who contributed to the talkbacks um, that the, the bizarre um, sort of effect of this disease as well as taking things away is also to give back. Um, and we have a personal story in our family of somebody who was a very, very a uh, sort of terrifying figure in our family, um, a really difficult woman um, and who'd caused a lot of hurt and pain in the family. She got dementia and she lost all of that aggression, all of that meanness, and she became this 
sort of small, sweet, kind, caring. And it was, from her point of view, it was probably a very freeing experience to let go of all that pain and hurt. For us around her, it was also extraordinary because we were able to see someone who was really scary and broken and damaged, just let go of all that and be really present. And she was able to, you know, like meet um, her grandchild uh, for the first time and take joy in that in a way that maybe wouldn't be possible. So even on a tiny personal level, I think also the big, uh, the big thing about this play is not only that, which hopefully is also to say we see you for the people who are caring for for loved ones with this kind of disease. I mean, the amount of dedication and patience and just fortitude uh, that caring for someone with a degenerative disease uh, asks of, of someone you love is, is extraordinary. And I just want to... to to say to those people who are the carers that, that you are seen, that you are recognized and the extraordinary things that you have done, you know, they mean something. They don't just disappear into a black hole. Um, so yeah, and that, I think those are the most important things for me from the inside. I really believe that people should see Unraveled because it's a little bit to do with the fact that we're all going to face something like this in our lives. We're all going to face a time when we're going to get older and we're going to change. And how do you negotiate that? I also think that um, we are all going to face some kind of challenge like this. As medical science makes us live longer, we're going to get older and we're all going to have these. But I think it could, uh, we're going to have... Something is going to kill us, probably a lot slow, like a lot slower than it used to do. Um, and whether you're the carer or the person suffering, this is going to be our future, and therefore it's completely universal. Um, and it's so interestingly enough, a play which on the surface is about neuroscience and art, or neuroscience and music, and the interface of of those two things, um, is actually profoundly about being human and one of the things that Ravel says um, and I've not been very good at touching on that it turns out that Ravel who wrote Bolero was actually suffering from the same disease at the same age at the same time that he wrote Bolero and they have this Anne and Bolero have this connection over a hundred years which obviously is imaginary but well maybe it's not but um, it's uh, the idea that um, you can have like who are you are you that which you do in the first 50 years of your life or the last 20? Like who, um, who, how are you defined? We define people by are they sick or are they well? But maybe we need to open up those um, categories a little bit more. So not only are we all going to face a situation where we might be a carer or a caree, I think it really asks some profound questions about how the mind works. And that's why Dr. Miller, the real Dr. Miller, was is so fascinated by this. Um, because he's like, so can you turn off one part of the brain and wake up another part of it? Because that's what this disease seems to do, at least for a short time. And the implications of that are, you know, go to the real heart of who we are. Our brains are our motors. Um, if you can switch one bit off and, and wake another bit up, uh, what an extraordinary thing that would be. Um, and so these implications are, are so universal. I love people who watch this and say, well, I'm not creative. I don't paint, I don't write music, I'm not an actor. And you're like, yes, but maybe you are, but you just haven't discovered it yet. And I think that's what's beautiful about some of the patients that we got to interview, is that some of them were like, they were people who had no contact with this kind of world they thought you know I'm not an artist I'm not someone who makes things and then because of this disease sort of setting them free they made all kinds of beautiful things music paintings this guy who made these incredible sculptures out of stones um, in spirals and uh, these the idea that we who are we and how do we access those parts of ourselves? I think is like I mean that applies to everybody uh, which is why I think it's a beautiful story, because it could just be about a woman who gets sick and how her husband copes. 
but it's also a play about like who are we uh maybe you can be an accountant for 70 years and then discover you're a painter or the other way around so we are having an amazing talk back on june the 26th which brings together all the things that this play um, touches on and we are so amazingly lucky we have people from the absolute top flight of both the science and the um, creativity fields to talk about this. Uh, so we have Dr. Bruce Miller, who is, runs the um, M Memory and Aging Center in, in UC San Francisco, who is really one of the premier neurologists in the world, uh, but has this particular interest in uh, looking at the brain and creativity uh, and how they work together and even almost looking at creativity as maybe a way of treating the brain or helping the brain in in extremis. And then on the other side, we have this extraordinary, extraordinary opportunity to meet David Milch, who is the creator of Deadwood, all of these amazing shows. Now, he is suffering from Alzheimer's and he made the incredibly brave decision to instead of hiding it and trying to keep it from people, he decided to talk about it publicly. And he in fact did the whole last series of Deadwood while suffering from Alzheimer's. Um, now, he is now cared for by his wife um, and he's in quite advanced stage Alzheimer's and he is still prepared to come on. And the one thing that lights him up, that makes him unbelievably connected and back in the reality of now is telling stories and his wife records them and he he comes in, he will pitch her a new idea every day and that's one of the things that keeps him going and keeps her going and, and I think that's a beautiful expression of a mind of someone that we all have experienced the work of a guy at the top of his game um, embracing this terrifying um, diagnosis and being brave enough to speak about it um, and what it's like to be told you have Alzheimer's when you're at the top of your career and what do you do next? Um, and how also his creativity is the thing that's keeping him going. Um, so we will have a, an opportunity to speak with David Milch, which um, is extraordinary. Um, and then we'll be able to, all of us, talk about how this play brings together, you know, Dr. Bruce Miller and David Milch and how suddenly we have this common ground. Um, and that to me seems like an extraordinary conversation um, to have, especially after having watched the play and maybe thought about these things and thought about a little bit about brains and, and how they work and what they mean and, and how creativity is woven into that. You've really got to come to the conversation on June the 26th because it's absolutely one time unique experience of seeing one of the top neurologists in the world in conversation with one of the top um, TV writers in the world. You know, Dr. Bruce Miller from the Aging and Memory Center in conversation with David Milch, who is the creator of Deadwood. And having access to David Milch in this brave journey he's making of being public about his Alzheimer's diagnosis and how creativity keeps him going. And I just can't think of a better way to round out watching the play than to have a live conversation with these incredible people. The GBHI or Global Brain Institute, um, we all have brains. <laughs> it's a completely universal experience. And it's funny. Um, I think that we, we have this funny saying that we've had in our family now since we've done this play, which is, you know, brains are the new, the new black. Um, it was such a huge mystery of being human for so long and we're finding out so many more things about our brains and how they work and how they influence our behavior and, and our experience. And um, the GBHI was really formed to push beyond the sort of clinical doctor um, view of neurology. Um, a, a little bit like something that like Oliver Sacks does, you know, kind of take brain science and put it in the context of everyday experience. And because we all have brains and because we are all, whether we know it or not, thinking, using them every single day, um, it's almost 
the most important thing we can do is to find out about how brains work and and what makes them function well and what what can you know heed them um impede them sorry and so i think that the gbhi is reaching out beyond you know oh you would only see a neurologist if you had a problem and saying what can all this science that we now know about our own brains really tell us about our whole experience about being human and they really want to answer some of those big questions uh dr bruce miller is you know, one of his his sort of primary interests beyond teach, uh, you know treating his patients is to explore how uh, neurology and creativity go together, because he can see in the future that that might be a way to treat people who have problems or just a way of like maximizing. You know, there's that old adage we only use twenty five percent of our brain, and what should we do with all the rest of it? Um, and so this is really on the cutting edge of how science and art can work together. And I think we think of those two things as such different um, disciplines, you know, and that there's no meeting place, but there are so many meeting places for science and art. And I think we'll find more and more of those as we go on. I think that theatre is essential and the best um, argument I can have from that is that we have always done it since the ancient Greeks, we know how they did it. But, you know, even before that, we, the reason that people, you know, talk about how watching TV or listening to music got them through the pandemic is that we have this basic human need to have our, our experience reflected back to us in music, in theater, in film, in TV, something, uh, you know, something which tells us more about ourselves or about being human. And storytelling is you know the most essential thing that we have we've done it since we were humans um and i think there's something unique about live theater because um there's something slightly more passive about sitting back and watching a tv show or a film and it will transport you but there is nothing nothing on earth like having the experience of going into a room and having exper an experience in the theater or a concert or something live with all those other people. It's also the one thing that we've really been deprived of for the last 18 months of having that communal experience. Um, and doing it on a local level is so important. I love, I love, love, love that this play, we had people watching it in Germany, in Saudi Arabia, you know, we've had, it's, it had, does have a truly global reach because it's online. But I also think you should go into a small theatre in LA and go and see a play about brains and music and creativity and come out with your mind blown uh, because you've just seen that, you know, 20 minutes from your house, that that's essential too. Um, and that you should be able to gather again with small groups of people that live in the city you live in and have one of those experiences. Um, and that's why theatre is essential and why we must, must, must support our small theatres and our big theatres in opening up again and, and showing live events. I think we're getting there slowly uh, and it's a bumpy road, but, but it is essential. We've done it for thousands and thousands of years. Um, and I think we all felt that huge gap that was in our lives in the last 18 months of not being able to gather together and watch or experience something together. I cannot wait until we can do Unraveled in real life, as my daughter tells me, IRL. Um, so yes, we are making plans now to stage this production as a live production. And as much as we got from doing it in the medium we did, because in some ways it's a play about isolation, so it sort of actually gained something from the medium we did it in, all of us isolated, but it'll also gain a huge amount from being live. We are hoping for the same cast. In fact, uh, Dr. Bruce Miller, who's the, you know, the head of the GBHI was like, I like that guy who played me, you want to keep him. Um, so uh, I, I think we'd love to keep the same cast. It'll obviously depend on availability and, uh, but we're actually hoping it and looking into doing a production that may also go into a theatre in the UK. So there might be a different cast in the UK. I'm lucky I have both passports, so um, I can I can do both both sides. Uh, but yes, there was a unique chemistry and a unique um, feeling about this cast. Also, the, everybody there was was exactly right. I felt anyway. This is from the inside. Um, so we it would be hard to do better. Um, 
but and also all of those people are all theatre actors and would know how to translate Nikki as a theatre director she would know how to translate uh, what we did in one particular medium into the theatre medium so fingers crossed uh, within the next 12 to 18 months we will be doing this live and and again also probably in more than one city so that uh, we can really give a wide range of people an opportunity to see it live so jake the, pl the playwright uh had this idea once we cast unraveled and we were able to use actors that he'd really already worked on in fact uh, leo who plays dr miller was i was rehearsing with him in another one of jake's plays when the pandemic hit and we got closed down. Um, this group of actors was so unique in their range and just their talent that I think it became clear that we could slot these people into a number of Jake's plays. And actually beyond that, what LA does not have is uh, a rep theatre. Uh, we still have one in England uh, something like the National Theatre where it does its own productions and uses, sometimes, anyway, all the artists in the Royal Shakespeare Company uses the same actors for a whole season. Um, and, and if you look at like something like American Horror Show, it, it's a very fun um, concept to see somebody, and also a group of actors who really have chemistry and work together well, um, translate that into all kinds of different plays. Uh, so I think the pipe dream is that this group of actors, plus another couple of people who have been very involved in Jake's plays over the years, would um, function as a rep company like that and would present um, a number of classic plays interspersed with Jake's plays. For instance, you know, you would do Hamlet and then we'd do um, uh, Our American Hamlet, which is a take on Hamlet um, and in the story of John Wilkes Booth. Um, so, yes, we are working towards that. We just had a reading of the new draft of our American Hamlet, Jake's play, which looks at kind of um, what we remember. And so it looks it's looking at memory and fame and what, you know, the kinds of things that make headlines. Um, and of course, in the context of the Booth family, where John Wilkes Booth is the one that we remember, the assassin rather than his brother, who was actually a very famous actor or his father, who was also a very famous actor. Um, why do we choose to, rem to remember the guy who shot Lincoln? Why do we glorify uh, the shooters? And my God, you know, we live in a world where that happens horribly often. Uh, and, and I think there is a sea change in the world saying, let's focus on the victims, not on the, on the people who perpetrate these terrible crimes, and transposing that onto the story of John Wilkes Booth. So when we realized that we could pretty much cast two of his plays with the same actors that did Unraveled, we were like, hmm. So I think we think we're, we're really working on that. We had this reading, we did a reading of, in person, we did it outside in a courtyard of, um, you know, our kind of dream team to do that play, which was a lot of the same people. And uh, I think that one of our five year projects is going to be bringing that to fruition, finding a home for it in LA. And, having that kind of old fashioned rep company that uh, we would also want it to really be representative of the diversity of, of LA. Um, and Jake has always wanted to do a Chicano um, Hamlet. And so there would be some real opportunities to make it more diverse as well. We rehearsed uh, the Our American Hamlet with a really diverse cast so that it can really reflect the kind of um, actors that LA can offer. And and I think that that's truly exciting. Hi, I'm Lucy Davenport and I'm one of the actors in the play Unraveled. If you've enjoyed my conversation today, please come join us on June the 26th for um, our showing of the play followed by a live conversation with David Milch and Dr. Bruce Miller. You can find everything you need to know about this, the play and the live conversation afterwards at unraveledplay.com. That's unraveled with two L's, play.com.